Welcome, welcome, welcome. God is good. Amen. I did a Bible study series years ago that I called by, um, Bumper Sticker Christianity. In it, I took these colloquial sayings of Christians like, God bless you. God loves you. Amen. And one of them is, God is good. And I sort of took apart that those trite sayings that we sort of throw out there, right? But when we say God is good, it is an amazing capacity for God's goodness. You know, many of us expect God's greatness, but I love his everyday goodnesses. Breathing, air, sun, love. It's, it's an everyday goodness in our lives. I love the greatness of God, the, the big parts of God, the, the healing of cancers and the dividing of a Red Sea, the moving of a hurricane. I, they're unbelievable. But the daily beautiful small goodnesses of God are something we can never neglect and never not recognize in our lives because God truly is good. Amen, amen, and amen. I'm about to channel my 1979, 1980 inner self with a song, um, a, a, a Bible study from a song called Hopelessly Devoted to You from the musical Grease. One of my favorite songs from that show. I remember singing it in my late teens. It was just something that we sang all the time, Hopelessly Devoted to You. And God gave me that in my spirit this week, that title, Hopelessly Devoted to You. I long to be wholly devoted to God. Don't you? There's a longing in my heart to be truly, wholly, and hopelessly devoted to God. But it amazes me how far things can get out of line when I'm not paying attention. It's easy to let it, that whole devotion to God slip by. In weak moments, I can spend money that I've put back for giving, and I use it for myself, right? And halfway through uh, a TV show, I realize I'm laughing at things that dishonor and offend God. So quickly, they can get by me. Bad habits can gain the upper hand if I don't deal with them daily. I bet you are the same way. And worse yet, self-indulgence can trump my devotion to God. Maybe you can relate to all of this. If we're not careful, it's easy to let other things in the world become obsessions. Redirecting, and this is an important word, redirecting our love and our devotion to God. We will always have a devotion towards something a devotion toward family, or our work, or our church, or a, a sports team, right? Or a, a, a worldly passion. Those things will redirect the devotion that we're supposed to have for God. That is such an important word. When I give my devotion to anything else other than God, I'm being unfaithful. I'm being unfaithful. Why? Because God deserves my whole heart. He, he deserves it all. Now, the word devotion means a profound dedication to something. The Hebrew noun that is used here is the word harem, harem. And it means an exclusive dedication. And it has its root in separation and exclusion. In other words, my devotion to God has an exclusiveness in me. It has a separation in me. And it has an exclusion of everything else. That's what it means to be wholly devoted to God. Paul giving the reason that he thought it would be better for people not to marry during, during their lives. He told the Corinthians for their benefit not to do this because it, it gives you an undistracted devotion to God to not be married. Now, it's not for everyone. It's just for some. But the truth is the same. It's 1 Corinthians 7.35. 
And he says this, this I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. Paul was saying that if there's something in your life that would cause you to have an undistracted devotion to God, then don't have it in your life. Put it away. In the second pin, uh, epistle to Corinthians, Paul was worried that people might be drawn away by false teachers. And Paul, again, references this devotion to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.3. 2 Corinthians 11.3. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, that your minds will be led away from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Paul said that your minds might be led astray. Our minds, our thoughts. What he's saying is that our devotion to God kind of begins here in our thought, or, or the distraction thereof begins here that when we begin to think on other things and look to other things and to dwell on other things, that all of a sudden our devotion to God has been changed. It's been qualified by something else. It's been distracted. As God's children, we are to be wholly and hopelessly devoted to the Lord. How? Let me show you. If we keep our our we keep his commandments and our eye on the commandments, we have a better shot uh, of that whole devotion to God. Solomon brings the Ark of the Covenant back into the temple, and he calls on the people to be wholly devoted by doing one thing. Let me show you. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 61. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 61. Let your heart be therefore wholly devoted to our Lord, our God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. Paul says our devotion to him begins by living an honorable life of integrity. Our devotion to him begins with living a holy life. If we live holy lives, then the distractions in our lives become lessened and lessened and lessened and lessened. But what's happening in the church and what's happening in this world are that other things are taking our affections and attentions away from our whole devotion to God. How can that be? How can we possibly let that happen? It happened to Solomon later in life. Now, remember we just read how Solomon said, if we keep God's commandments, then we will be wholly devoted to him. Our devotion will be exclusive, separated, undeterred, undetoured, and set apart. But look what happened to Solomon when he left the elemental teachings of the commandments. This is 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 4. Three chapters later from what we just read, says this. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. Notice that Solomon was wholly devoted to God when he kept his commandments, but when he turned away to other gods, he no longer kept the commands of the Lord, and there he became devoted to something else. What was it? Pagan wives. Unbelieving wives. Now, this is not a commentary on equally yoked or unequally yoked marriages. This is a, a, a study about letting our attentions and affections go to other places and other things. It's so easy in this world to find something else to devote ourselves to. I'm going to devote myself to being the best employee in the company. Admirable. I'm going to devote myself to being the best singer in the choir. Admirable. I'm going to devote myself to be the best spouse or best mother or father that there's ever been. Admirable and valid 
desires. But when those devotions overshadow the devotion to God, then we've put something in the wrong place. We, Jesus addressed this. We, we cannot serve, he says, two different things. We cannot serve something in this world and God equally. Because if we try to do that, one is going to take precedence over the other. And usually we fall off the wrong side of that fence, amen? A lot of believers ride that fence between world and God. Spirit and flesh. Holiness and unholiness. And most often we fall off the fence on the unholy side. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be, and here's the word, devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth, mammon, the world. We can't do it. There is no way, because his word is true. You know, God doesn't say things because they might be. He doesn't say things because they might happen, and he doesn't put things in his word that are suggestions or could-be's. He puts them down because they are, because they are perfect, because they are true, because they are right, because it's the truth. And so when Paul said, when Jesus says, you cannot serve two different things, you cannot serve me, and then you cannot serve something in this world because if you do, you'll learn to despise one, be devoted to the other. But how often do we end up really wholly devoted to God? To be honest, doesn't, don't the things of this world pull us that we begin to be devoted to something on this earth? And when God says through Jesus and he says, you'll despise the other thing, that word is a harsh word, to despise something. We would come to despise the things of God. We stop wanting to listen to Christian music because that music's better. We stop going to church because fishing on Sunday morning is better. We stop listening to the pastor's message because we're tuning out because we just it doesn't tickle us anymore. That word despise doesn't just mean a, a full-on hatred. We begin to choose things that are not of God. We can be devoted to congregations and spouses and children and jobs and neighbors and our government, but we cannot serve any of them as our master. As, as believers, we are devoted to many people and accomplishments and many tasks, but above all, we have to be devoted to God. We have one master, one Lord, who is God. I tend, this is just a personal confession, I tend to withhold my time, my adoration, my dedication, my honesty, and my gratitude from God sometimes. Because I'm busy doing other things. I'm busy, I'm just busy doing other things. And it's not that I withhold it on purpose, but I lavish my affections on other things. Oh, that was great. You did awesome. That Again, exemplar in your behavior to commend someone for a good job. But if I do that and forget that God's the one who blessed that person with the goodness of that job and the ability to do well in that job, then I, what am, I'm missing the whole big picture that it's all about God. It's not about us. It's not about how good we do or how well we accomplish things. When we commend someone, wouldn't it be nicer to say something like this? Wow, God was awesome through you. God was amazing. Oh, God blessed you with that ability and that anointing. How amazing was that? You see, that's a way we can be devoted to God and still commend on the earth. Without full surrender on our parts, we will never be fully devoted to God. It's only when God means more to you than anything. I have these conversations all the time. I cannot wait to go home to be with Jesus. I cannot wait to go and be with the one who died for me. 
I, there is a yearning, a deep, impatient yearning inside of me to go home to be with Jesus. It is something that never leaves me. This desire to serve him never, ever leaves me. And I'll talk to people and say that, and they'll go, oh, I, I, I want to see my grandchildren grow up. Oh, I, I want to see this happen, or, or I, I want to see my children saved. You have just placed more devotion to those things than, than to God. Your wanting to be with Jesus should be paramount to everything else. And if there is something holding you back from that devotion, we need to re-examine the priorities in our lives. Asaph was a writer of Psalms. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 73, because in it, Asaph, he's looking at the prosperity of the wicked. He's looking at how people are prospering who don't love God, and he's pretty angry about it. But then he gets to the place through, through the psalm that he declares this great passionate statement. And it's Psalm 73, verse 25. And he says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. Asaph knew God was far more excellent than anything on this earth. I wonder if we, as the believers, the body of Christ, can get to that place where we can say, Lord, there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. I, I would love to see grandchildren grow up. I'd love to see children saved. I'd love to see my son or my daughter uh, graduate from college. I'm just throwing out things. I would love to see a promotion that my son is about to get in, in his work. I would love to be able to retire and sit back for a little bit and just relax. Asaph said, there is nothing on this earth that I desire more than you. Now, I'm not condemning your love for grandchildren or children or salvation. I'm just saying that if there is something that you think is more important than being with Jesus for eternity, something's out of whack. Something is, is askew. Something is wrong. And we have become attached to people and things more than we should. Uh, more than we should. Asaph knew the excellence of God, and it was greater than anything. Listen, God is our peace and our joy, not people, not things. He is our salvation and our security, not people, not things. He is our daily portion and strength. Not people, not things. Nothing on earth. There's no wealth in earth, no honor or fame that can come close to God. Nothing. Even in heaven, there is nothing more spectacular than God. Angels bow to God. They sing his praises even in heaven. Can you imagine an angel distracted from singing God's praises because something else has taken his affection in heaven? No. No and no. The only one worthy of our whole devotion is God himself. It is for that very reason that Asaph comes to the conclusion that earth has nothing I desire beside God. Nothing, nothing. Now, there are benefits to being wholly devoted to the Lord. Wholly devoted. A devoted heart draws near to God and experiences his presence in everyday life. When we draw near to God, the Bible says he draws near to us. And when I'm wholly devoted to him, I have his presence in my life all the time. 24-7, every breath, every thought, God is in it. If I prioritize my life right, he is in it all. Praise God. Praise God. A fully surrendered, devoted heart calls us to fellowship with Jesus, absolute beautiful fellowship with Jesus, so that his power can equip us to carry out his plans in this earth. Only, only when we're wholly devoted can that happen. 
half time with Jesus doesn't work. I've tried. I've tried being a friend of the world and a friend of God. I've tried having one foot in the world and one foot in, in God. And it, we, it doesn't work. You know it doesn't work. It never does. Devotion allows us to absolutely adore him because he's God. Can we just remember that? That he is God. The very God who upholds everything and yet withholds nothing from his children. We are all devoted to something. Just look at where you spend your time, what you talk about the most, what consumes your thoughts the most, and you'll begin to get a pretty good idea about what, where your devotion lies. If I awaken in the morning and I'm still anxious about something, I've struggled with it through the night, I'm anxious about it in the day, then my whole attention has been on that thing. But when I can awaken and my first thought is, God, you've got it, or my first thought is merely God, then I realize that I've devoted that problem I've devoted that situation. I've devoted my heart, my emotions, and my thoughts to him wholly. And that's what he's looking for. That's what God is seeking, for us to be hopelessly devoted to him. hmm. This whole study reminds me of a song. Isaac Watts wrote amazing hymns. And he wrote a hymn, and he wrote this line in it. Love so amazing, love so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Can I read that again? Love so amazing, love so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. God doesn't demand it from us. We should demand it from ourselves. That in light of God's absolute greatness and goodness, that we should demand it out of ourselves to give God our whole devotion, hopelessly devoted to the one, the only one. Let me just throw out some names. King of kings, Lord of lords, redeemer, restorer of the breach, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the Almighty, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the morning song, the song in the night, the morning star, the beginning, the end, the only wise God, immortal, invincible, immovable, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, faithful, true, Peace. Those are all his names. There is no name on this earth that can match up with those. Nothing named on this earth. Food, family, jobs, church, they're all names. And none of those names can compare with the only, only God. It's time to turn our devotions wholly and fully to the Lord. Remember the definition of harem. It means to be exclusively dedicated. Exclusively dedicated to the Lord. It doesn't mean that we cannot be dedicated to do good and right things. It just means that he has to be above all those good and right things. Oh, church, do you know what would happen if we became hopelessly devoted to God and stopped loving the things of this earth and loved him more and more and more and more, amazing power would come over the church. If you do not know this God who loves you beyond anything, will you let us introduce him to you? Will you call brushstroke at the office? Will you get on the website, get online, 
And let us help you, guide you, and lead you to this great God who loves you, who paints a picture of his life with yours, one brushstroke at a time. God bless you. Introducing the new Zulon Press book, In Moments Like These, Volume 2, by Jenny Pfister. Moments Like These, Volume 2, is available at Christian bookstores and online. Purchase it today.